Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks a million for joining us. Very good to have you here. We should expect some more people to join us in the uh, few minutes uh, that um, we will have Neil talking to us. But I just want to introduce myself. I am Thomas Bellio. I'm the head of public diplomacy and outreach here at the embassy in uh, Berlin. I work with my colleague, Dr. Elias ben Mena, who's helping us today with the technical side of things. And we are very happy to have with us uh, Neil Calderwood, who uh, came to Germany some years ago. He's going to tell us about his story, moving to Germany, what brought him here, how he stayed here, how he saw an opening in the market, and is now uh, very successfully, and hopefully into the future, very successfully operating the dalrieta.de uh, website and physical shop, uh, which is selling Irish produce and uh, some produce that you might might not necessarily regularly get here in Germany, but he's been able to procure and is uh, gaining a very loyal following. And uh, Neil will be telling us about his plans for expansion and his story from how he came here and what he is doing currently. Now, before we start and before I hand over to Neil, I know it's not Neil you want to talk to and you want to hear rather than myself, but I just want to say, we're recording today's session. These uh, videos go to posterity. I would ask that you keep your um, uh, uh, devices on mute until such time as you want to ask a question. If you want to ask a question, you can turn on your camera, you can wave at us, or you can use the digital hands up facility within the Zoom call. With that, and without any further ado, Neil, I hand the floor over to you. Everybody's waiting to hear your story, so please take it from the beginning. Tell us about yourself, and the uh, floor is yours. All right. Uh, am, I, am I live? Yep, looks like I am. All right. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction, Thomas. Um, I hope I can live up to it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm Neil Calderwood. I, uh, as Thomas has just explained, I have founded in fairly recent times a, a, a shop in Berlin, which some of you may be familiar with. And if you're not, well, drop by next time you're, you're around. Uh, so I'm going to talk all about myself and what I've been up to and all that kind of thing. Uh, so if you'll just bear with me a second, I will get my presentation up and running. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, so yeah, um, so I know I grew up in Belfast in, uh, well, born in the late seventies, you know, grew up through the eighties and nineties. And um, Belfast was an interesting place to grow up in those days, as you can probably imagine. I mean, this kid is not me, but it could have been. Um, I was about this child's age at that time. Seeing soldiers in the street every day was a fairly normal thing that we all went through. And um, I definitely looked through the gun sights of a soldier once or twice in my, in my youth. I can distinctly remember that happening. And it's, you know, looking back on it, and I'm sure most of you looking at this picture just find it deeply weird. And looking back on it, it obviously was deeply weird. Um, but for me, that was just normality. You know, that was just life. What, what you grew up with is, is what you know. And that's kind of what it was like for us. So like I say, it was a bit of a weird place to grow up. And besides this stuff, I mean, this isn't the only thing that Belfast is known for, of course. I mean, we're also known for various glorious failures um such as you can see here um but yeah when we fail we really fail in style um and i suppose i didn't want to add myself to the list of glorious failures from belfast and so as i as i got a bit older i you know got myself educated as you do and um thought i would spread my wings a bit and go out into the world um so next stop for me was edinburgh which is obviously a lovely place and um you know, quite different from Belfast. I, you know, spent four years there studying and just generally coming to coming to terms with life in a slightly more normalized environment than, than the weird traumatic place that Belfast was. Um, and yeah, like I say, I spent four years there studying, uh, moved on to London and kind of by accident, you know, I'd studied like linguistics and languages and stuff like that, which of course helped me 
later on when I when I came to Germany when I, when I came here because I already had a good knowledge of German but I didn't I, I expected to do something in that field um, and I didn't I, I ended up accidentally becoming a, a designer of digital things um, originally voice user interfaces and and later websites and apps and that kind of thing and you know it turned out that I actually I really liked it like I, it was by accident I fell into this career in design um, but I really enjoyed trying to solve problems for people and make things work better for people. So, you know, I, I started working in agencies in London, usually working on fairly large scale, long term projects for really major clients. You know, people, uh, people that you would have heard of, you know, the likes of Ford and VW and even Aston Martin at one point. And it wasn't just cars. I also did things like, you know, likes of Vodafone and stuff like this, working on like really big projects for people like that. But, you know, I mean, I only ever tolerated London, to tell you the truth. I was never really a big fan of London at the best at times. And I always find that London really takes much more from you than it gives back. Um, I, I wanted a city that I wanted to live in a city that were, where maybe I could find a lot of the things that I liked about London, but not so many of the things that I didn't, you know, just the the, the hecticness, the, the constant strain of life. And, and I, I started to wonder about Berlin because all the way back in, in, in Belfast, I, I always had this weird affinity for Berlin. Maybe it's maybe it's because you grow up in a, in a divided city and, and this is also a divided city. I don't know. I don't know what it was, but I always felt like there was something about Berlin. And so, you know, I started to come back and forth here a bit and see if it really was the sort of place that I would want to live. And um, I decided it was, but then it took me quite a long time to get work here. Um, but after several years of trying, I found a really nice job here working for a really cool agency and it really allowed me to spread my wings, you know, I, I, um, I got to work on some really interesting projects, it got more and more multinational, I was, I was doing a lot of traveling, I was, you know, there was days when like I would wake up in Berlin, uh, have my breakfast here, I would have my lunch in Milan and I would have my dinner in Madrid, uh, I was doing a lot of running around and working on some of these really quite exciting projects and it was really good and you know that, that was the first like four or five years of, of of my time in berlin that was that was how it was for me it was going great you know everything was going really well and and working on all these really interesting things and then and then it wasn't and i'm not exactly sure i mean, think the causes are multiple but i feel like me and the whole sort of digital design industry grew apart in some way maybe it was because i got older maybe it was because i didn't necessarily agree with the direction that the whole industry seemed to be moving in and 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 you know I, like i said before i was always about trying to make things work better for people but i felt like more and more it was about you know turning people into data points and trying to extract more and more from them and, and it felt like it was sort of becoming very dehumanized and i don't know i was i was losing touch with it and and it seemed less and less interested in what i had to say and what i could do um and the work just started to dry up and it, it was it just got harder and harder i, I was just getting less interest in, in what i could do and you know, it's just sort of a difficult thing to deal with at the kind of halfway through your work in life when you just seem to have run out of options. And so you know, myself and, and my wife, was, we talked a lot about, well, where might we go from here? Um, she'd always had a dream of like having some kind of a, a, a shop that, you know, could be whatever, whatever she wanted it to be, that would sell nice things. And I looked like I was going to have some time in my hands, so I suppose we talked about it a bit. And I said, well, why don't I try to build it for you? Why don't, why don't I try to create this thing that you've, you've always dreamed of? Because I haven't got anything else going on right now. Um, another thing was I was really struggling in this transition to remote work because I depended, I realized that it depended so much on contact with people uh, and talking to others. And... Um, and I was totally missing that but with with all this remote work and I was finding that it just wasn't really working out for me. So I, I also wanted something tangible. And so we thought, well, OK, maybe it's time to open a shop. Um, we talked a lot about well, what, what kind of a shop would it be and what might we sell. And, and, and we, again, because of this background that we have, 
both of us in this kind of user-centered design industry, we try to think of it in terms of a problem that we wanted to solve. And the big problem that we both wanted to solve was that you just couldn't get decent bacon anywhere in Berlin. Uh, or if you could, you had to pay a fortune for it. And we thought, you know what, I'm sure we can do something about this. I'm sure we can do this better. Um, and so, yeah, we came up with this idea that we were going to bring Irish things to Berlin. And we told people that we were going to start importing sausages to Germany. And they thought we were absolutely mental or that it was some kind of practical joke. But that was the idea that we came up with. Um, now, the thing is, when people do these things a lot of the time, they'll come up with some grand concept and spend a lot of time and a lot of money developing it and looking and trying to make it all perfect. Um, and and we, coming from the, the background that, that we come from, we um, thought there's another way to do this. And, you know, the, the philosophy that um, gets used a lot in, in what I've done is this idea of build, measure, learn. You know, create a thing, put it out there, See how people respond to it, learn from that, change it a bit, build something else, repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, rather than this unfortunate um, situation where, where you see a lot of businesses where they'll, they'll put a lot of money into building, you know, a restaurant or a bar or a store or whatever it is, uh, spend a load of money up front and then they desperately need it to work because it has to pay the bills immediately because they're in, in a huge amount of debt. And they spend so much time developing their concept that they haven't really stopped to check if anybody else is interested in the concept or cares about it. So this is the thing. I mean, we had this we had this idea of what we thought we might want to do and what we thought this might be, but it really started from a very simple, small problem, which was let's get some decent bacon into Germany. Um, so we so we'll start from there and we'll build it. And we'll see how people respond to it. And, and we'll do this in, as I say, some kind of user-centered way. But, I mean, it was, yeah, where do you start when you've got absolutely no experience in this industry? Uh, you haven't done anything like this before. And, you know, the world's kind of conspiring against you with, you know, pandemics and lockdowns and everything else. So we started looking around. We thought about having a market stall, maybe to test this out but again the idea of a market stall in winter in, in in berlin as as the pandemic rages wasn't really going to get off the ground so we started looking around for for maybe a place where we could have a pop-up store or something like that where we could test this idea and i got really lucky i, I discovered that there was a, a place on ebersvall it was a nice cream shop and it was closed for the winter uh, because they don't open again until like April or something like that. So from October until March, April, they stayed closed. So they were looking for a, for a tenant to take it over the winter. And we thought, well, this is great, actually, because we don't have to sign any kind of a long-term lease. It's long enough that we get to test this idea, but uh, we're not on the hook for anything massive. You know, if this doesn't work out and we need to walk away from it, well, we're not, we're not hugely on the hook. Um, so... This is interesting, and 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 you know, like we had this idea about bringing food over from Ireland, and the thing about this was, as I said, it was an ice cream shop, which meant that it had lots and lots of freezers, and this was when we started to think, oh, you know what, we might have something here, we might be able to make this work. We can fill these freezers up with delicious sausages and bacon and stuff like that, and that's the start. I mean, even if we've got that, like that's that's the smallest thing, and we can try to build something around it. But you know that could be a start, and this is if if we can see if people are interested in this, then we'll just go from there. So that's kind of what we did. Um, <laughs> on the on the on the second of November, I just checked earlier. On the second of November, we founded the company. Like I said, utterly clueless about what we were really doing. Um, with uh, at that point, not even a bank account or anything like that. We put in whatever startup capital we needed to to find the company. Um, and, you know, we still had everything to do to actually get it up and running. So, like I said, we didn't even have a bank account or anything like that. That was the 2nd of November. I checked the papers. That's when we founded it. Um, yeah, this is what was going on at the time, you know, the pandemic and difficulties with logistics. Brexit was looming and making the prospect of importing foods from the UK near impossible, which is partly why we focused on Ireland. Um, so yeah, 2nd of November, we started. And on the 18th of November, we opened. Um, and so this is what we did. You know, we just kind of slapped some posters around and, and 
tried to draw people's attention to the fact that we existed, put some things in the window. But of course, like we're squatting in someone else's shop. We can't do anything to the place. We can't like brand it. So it's really quite limited what we could do. But we just put up some posters. It's the most ad hoc, like cheapskate looking thing. But um, it started the work um, on our first day. We So we formed the company on the 2nd of November, like I said. Um, on the 18th of November, we opened. Um, I, that is the receipt of the first uh, transaction that we did. I kept it. Um, and we took 13 euros and 50 cents. That was the only customer we had that day. We took in 1350. But it was a start. We got going. And we, you know, we were hugely excited about it. It's obviously a tiny amount of money. It's not even going to pay the bills. Um, but we got really excited because we thought, well, somebody came over the door and bought some stuff from us. And we'll see where we go from there. And that was, as I say, the 18th of November. By Christmas, uh, we were we were taking, I don't know, like five, six, seven hundred euros a day. Word had got around about us and people, as it turned out, were really excited that, that we were there. Um, people were feeling pretty despondent because of the fact that they couldn't get home to their families over, over Christmas, you know, because of the lockdown rules and everything else. And they were just really grateful that we were there and bringing them some of these things that they would miss. And it meant that, okay, so they couldn't be with their whole families, but they could have some sort of a family Christmas. And, um, you know, people just responded really well to what we were trying to do. And it was just really nice. So like a, f a few weeks after opening the store started to look like this, you know, it started to fill up with lots of, lots of nice things. And um, yeah, you know, we, we did our best with it. Like it was just a, a small space which wasn't really suited to what we were trying to do but we did our best with it and and we tried our hardest to just be as warm and welcoming as we could be because we were all including ourselves just going through a really hard time it was really tough out there and we just tried to be warm and, and to give people some kind of welcome and some kind of comfort and you know people started to respond to that and um We've just gone from there. So, you know, we were in that shop for about four months. No, sorry. From, yeah, from November till March. So, yeah, rough, roughly four months. And it was by that stage, we like our concept that we wanted to test um, was really starting to prove itself. You know, it, it, we were starting to think, oh, this is definitely viable. So the next stage was let's see if we can find a permanent store. Um, and we started to scratch around and, and we had a, a couple of really good prospects, but, you know, it was, it was taking time. Um, so, sorry, I, I, before I dig, I, I just want to go back to like what we, what we were, um, what I was saying before, which is that, like, we've tried to always do this in a, in a, a way that builds on things that we've learned in the, in the you know design industry so we tried to do this in a really user-centered way so so like building on like i said building on, on on this sense of community that we're starting to build up and just reaching out to people and saying like well what should we do and using that to guide us you know we weren't trying to impose a concept on people and say like well, you, you should like this we were just following the the needs of our customers really and and trying to make something that they wanted and part of that was you know just really again what's the simplest cheapest quickest thing that you can do to get the information that you need to move forward we just stuck a notice board on the wall, wall and said to people hey what do you want and you know we've done our best to fulfill those needs and pretty much all of those things on there we we were able to figure out how to, how to do them and, and we've done lots more since you know but this is this is just always the approach that we've taken is, is that we're, we're building this to, not around what we wanted to be but what people want it to be and, and then maybe ultimately it can become the, the thing that we dream of um sorry I, I just got slightly mixed up my slides so uh, like I say um yeah we were we were there until around March uh and and it started to look like you know this was this was getting somewhere so we started to look for a permanent place um but it was taking time so we had to you know take another sort of temporary stop which was just around the corner from where we were in Gaudi so it was, a, it was a really pretty shop and uh, but tiny and you know in another way this allowed us to validate our concept a bit more because it, because it was really pretty and we thought okay let's try and make this place really nice the last one was looks wise was not what we would like it to be um but this one we thought we could do a bit more with you know 
trying to make it look pretty um and to test that out and see how people respond to it but but uh, we like i say we were really limited by the fact that this space was very very small um but at least it kept us going in terms of keeping us in in people's minds while we were trying to figure out a way forward for for a permanent location um the difficulty with it was that uh it just we obviously didn't do as much business here we couldn't because it was, it was smaller we were limited in what we could offer and all these ideas that we had for growth and expansion were just kind of stalled for a while and and so you know we just limped for a couple of months in the background we were negotiating for a, a, a permanent place but it was really taking a long time and and we didn't understand why uh so the lease ran out in this place and for a couple of months we had nowhere to go at all um you know we just put everything in storage uh we had the occasional customer phone us up in a panic asking us if we could please sort them out with some barry's tea because they were on their last tea bag and you know i'd scuttle around on my bike and and i mean it's really cool that people ask you to do those things but obviously it's not exactly a sustainable business um so like i say we were you know looking around for a place to, to settle and and put into action all of the things that we had learned over this this first phase of, of just you know trying to understand what what people wanted um and after months and months and months of we don't even know what was the cause of the delays but after months and months of delays we finally got our little place and it looks like this um it's much bigger it's kind of like the tortoise it's much bigger than it looks uh but we've got this you know lovely space in the front which we're gradually using to introduce all of the all of the goodies that, that people want to see um but more importantly actually we've got a huge amount of space out the back that we can use to implement the online store that we had always had in mind. So now we're not just selling the, the neighborhood or, or the Berlin, or we're selling to absolutely everywhere in Germany. We can we can reach everybody, um, which obviously makes the business uh, a, a lot more viable. Um, it's helping us a lot. And another thing that was really, like another thing that was really cool about the shop and the reason why we wanted it is because uh, like this was it as soon as we opened it, it was ready to go. Uh, kind of unfortunate that the the people who took it before us they they were ready to open. They had this nice concept where they were going to sell uh, pot plants, um, and they had done the whole shop up. They like sanded the floors down and and painted all the walls and that big fancy light that you see there. They had built all that. The shop was all all fully ready to go. And um, then they had to pull the plug um, because, uh, well, basically the, the the woman got pregnant and they figured that they couldn't have a baby and open a new business all at the same time. So like, just as they were about to open, they had to pull the plug on it and find a, find a new tenant pronto, which was great for us because we needed a place pronto. So we just stepped in and after, like I said, after several months of turning and throwing, we finally got this place. Um, but it just meant that we could roll in uh, in the finished shop um, and again, with this idea that we're, we're trying to follow with being as light and as simple as possible, this was perfect because we didn't spend months, you know, redecorating the place or, or, or building it, it to be what we wanted it to be. We just turned up and opened the doors. And of course, gradually we're tweaking it, improving it, um, adding to it, and we'll, we'll continue to do that. But our whole thing, our whole approach has always been like just get the doors open and get the business operating and even if it's not perfect don't fuss over it just go for it and and be authentic about it and people will understand that it's not perfect and it's a bit rough here and there because at the end of the day you're, you're still meeting their needs and you're still doing what what they want you to do um so that's you know been our philosophy all along and it's it's got us this far at least we've, we've really been scraping it at times you know just before we opened the place like we were almost broke um because there, there was like zero money coming in um we got really close to completely hitting the wall uh but we scraped it and like you know in the last couple of months we've been picking ourselves up off the floor and you know now we're now we're going well uh the thing is that the, the, the constant through all of this has just been the support that we've had from people. Um, you know, people have really, really responded well to what we've wanted to do. Uh, not just to the, 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 the things that we have on offer, but like 
they're just the people have just been really nice um they've been really supportive of us and they've, they've always looked for ways to include us in things and open doors for us and, and give us opportunities and you know that's like i say enabled us to kind of pick ourselves up the floor so i thought i'll just you know talk a bit about a few of the lessons that, that i've learned along the way of this um you know people always say don't let your dreams be dreams but i would actually say do let your dreams be dreams in that it's something to work towards but it's not where you should start um you know my, my wife like i say has long dreamed of having a shop like this uh she always talked about this uh, woman who she studied with at university who has this lovely like fancy deli in New York and it's beautiful and it looks like it was really expensive and and you know she just dreams of having a place like that one day um we don't have the resources to just do something like that and besides as I said given that we didn't really know anything about what we were doing to go straight in with a fancy and fully resolved concept like that would be madness um, and would probably lose your fortune but we can work towards it you know that yeah it's okay to have that as a dream it's just we can't start from there and we shouldn't start from there we need to build towards it gradually so you know we started with our scrappy pop-up and now we have our small but nice store and our online store and you know gradually we're we're picking up steam and and, and we're building up and uh you know we'll, we'll maybe we'll get to that dream but we don't need to start from it. Um, yeah, this is one of the things that I've learned about, about Germany. And I'm sure if any of you have lived in Germany for any length of time, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But when you're trying to do this like scrappy startup thing and, and hustling like crazy, I mean, I think the fact that we found, founded the company on the 2nd of November and had it open by the 18th, I mean, most Germans just can't get their heads around how we did that. And neither can I look back on it. Um, but anybody that, that spent any amount of time here will know it's not just the waves of bureaucracy. It's just, it's absolutely everything. Um, we have uh, wanted to move faster than the system would allow us on many occasions through this. Um, it can be frustrating because like you can see an opportunity for growth. You can see an opportunity to, you know, to really take your business forward. Um, but you just can't because things just won't allow it. Um, but besides that, I mean, I don't want to make that sound like some horrible criticism of, of Germany or anything like that, because this is a much bigger problem. Uh, it's definitely one of the things I've found with the logistics industry as well is um, it's amazing. It's kind of amazing to me as someone who's worked in and around these things for many years, you know, uh, building or designing apps and systems which integrate with these kind of global logistic systems you always think of it as this like finely tuned machine where everything's just hyper efficient and everything's been worked out to the last detail and then you start to actually try to interface with it and you find out that, yeah maybe the middle of it is like that you know the the middle of this network is super efficient but the outside of it is just basically blokes and porta cabins making phone calls and it's, it gets it gets really kind of rough around the edges at times um and and that the whole industry is like at, at every stage so you know you're trying to order things from a from a warehouse or whatever um and you don't really know when you're going to get it you don't really know what you're going to get and how much is going to turn up um how much you're going to have to pay for it it's and it's very very hard to plan a business around that and i guess it must be a lot easier when you have plenty of money and resources behind you and you can just buy large amounts of stock and just wait but you know when you're trying to do things in this scrappy way that we've been doing it where you buy relatively small quantities of things to test it to see if it's something that people want and then if they do well okay you can sink a bit more money into it later but if you're trying to do things that way and uh, then you're kind of dependent on the system to be uh rapid and, and efficient and it just isn't and you know brexit doesn't help pandemics don't help um, but even though as things are getting a bit better, it's still, yeah, it's not as efficient as we would like it to be. So you just kind of have to settle into that. You know, you just kind of have to accept that this is all going to take longer than you want it to. And whatever ambitions you have, whatever ideas you have, you got to just tone them down a bit because it's not going to go the way you would like it to. Um, yeah, another lesson, and someone said this to me really early on in this, don't pretend to be anything that you're not uh we are just two people doing our best we're not some large super smooth hyper efficient corporation we're not trying to compete with supermarkets uh or even you know 
like bigger, more established sort of local retailers. We're we're not. We're we're two people that are trying to figure this out. And the thing is, by being that, by just being honest and authentic about that, we find that people get it. They they get what we're trying to do. They get why things are the way that they are. They appreciate that we're doing our best. And um yeah, I mean, I think people. One of the things that people definitely appreciate about about what we're trying to do as a, as a business is just the authenticity of it. Um, you know, often like, and and again, this is one of the things that I think started to drive a wedge between me and the tech industry, is this whole sort of fake it till you make it attitude, where you know you pretend to be something bigger than you really are. So that people take you more seriously, and and you basically try to swindle people into imagining that you're a great big uh, business, um, which uh, carries a lot more clout than it really does. There's a lot of that around, and and I don't know. I I found from from doing this that there's really absolutely nothing wrong with saying, hey, you know, we're quite small, and uh, as it turns out, people actually respond to that positively. Like we don't we don't go around pretending to be anything other than who we are and people like it um so that's i suppose the lessons that i've that i've learned from doing this um and hopefully you know it's going to be onward and upward for us over the next while i hope um but certainly the the, the philosophy has been been paying off so far and um yeah so that's us that's what we do that's that's what we've been doing um if anyone has any questions or ideas suggestions offers of investment god i'd love that uh, <laughs> i'm happy to hear about it um but thanks for listening uh yeah thank you'll find your way you. that's 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 it thank you very much neil i have to say that um listening to you 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 it is very heartfelt it's very easy to hear your story uh from from start until you finish there is um is a lesson to everybody um so I, I was taking photographs of the screens there uh you know don't be something you're not uh you know eventually you'll find your way all very very useful tips and uh, as you say people respect it when you're honest and uh i would have to say that uh, anytime i've been down to your shop i've always had the friendly welcome and i appreciate uh, you letting me rummage through your freezers to see um, uh, what's available. Um, and I think that actually sums it up as well. You've got that sort of touch, you've got that sort of community feel uh, that you know, people who come in uh, feel, you know, it's like the when I was growing up, we didn't always go to the supermarkets. It was always, you know, go in, have the chat, have that interaction. And I, I found it to myself to be very, very uh, uplifting and, uh, you know, just to have that human interaction. And um, I hope I'm not out of, out of uh, place by saying that you, you do it very well and and and, and uh, I, I will be down to your shop over this weekend again actually uh, so maybe <laughs> I shouldn't be happy for my business but I, I found it very interesting there you said you 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 only tolerated London and um, it takes more than it gives and then you you had that uh, sort of sense of affinity even though you hadn't really visited as I understood Berlin being the divided city and Belfast uh, being the, having the history that it, that it does. And you said in your job, you, you, were dehum you were dehumanized and looking at data points and you just ran out of options and you opened the shop. It's, if, if you were doing it again, I mean, if you were doing it again, or if you're looking back on it, would you say that nobody has a magic formula, but would you say that you've, you've done it the right way and you found it very, very satisfying or you know, as you say, like London has taken more than it gives. Would you bypass anything or would you do it differently? Or what, what, what would you say to people? Yeah, um, yeah that's a really nice question. Uh, because I think when, when, we, when we all look at our own lives and we look at our own life story, I think we, we all have a tendency to post-rationalize and, and say, well, you know, I am where I am today and that makes total sense and th these things had to happen in this order in order for things to be this way um of course we don't know what the other possibilities would have been I think it was it like Douglas Adams used to say this thing about about a puddle uh, you know if a puddle was conscious it would sort of look and say well isn't it isn't it wonderful that I live in this this uh this dip in the earth which is exactly the same shape as me 
And, and, and you know, like we're, we're all molded by the things that happen in life. And then, of course, it makes sense that we are who we are and that we got to where we are because of the things that happened. Um, and, and it was actually something that I did want to talk about a bit because, you know, I, I obviously did that conventional route of, you know, getting a good education, going to university, getting a good job out of university, doing, you know, doing the career thing. Um, and, you know, up to a point it was going well until it wasn't. Uh, but the, one of the things that I've found out of this is, is like, what I've been able to do is to take the essence of the things that I actually enjoyed about that, like the, 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 the continuing fascination with human beings as for, for who they are. And, and, but also like finding lots of challenges, both large and small. I mean, I'm, I'm the sort of person that like, I sort of need to be constantly challenged. I find it more interesting when, 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 when things, well, unexpected things happen all the time. My wife is very much the sort of person who likes things to be within certain parameters and follow processes and, you know, no surprises. Whereas I find I get bored if it's like that, to be honest. I find that like I, I do better when I'm like constantly being surprised. And so every person that comes through the door is a new challenge. Uh, and meanwhile, on a larger scale, you've got all the business challenges that are going on. But that, but that's what makes it interesting. You've got these like series of tiny challenges which keep you constantly on your toes. And then you've got all these bigger ones. So the thing is that, um, you know, I found myself now doing something which, yeah, I would never, you know, at the start of this whole career path that I've taken, I would never have thought to do because um, that just was not a path that would have occurred to me. Uh, but I'm finding that it actually agrees with me very well because it just suits my character, but it, but it also suits my interests. And um, yeah, I mean, it would be easy to say, uh, you know, I could have done this in my twenties. I could have just, I could have just started this, and who knows where I would be by now? You know, maybe would be, maybe would have like twenty stores all over Germany, and I'd be rolling a money. Who knows? But on the other hand, like you have to make that journey in life sometimes to get to this point in order to see the way forward in the first place. So, yeah, it would, like I said, it would be easy to say I could have cut a whole lump out of it uh, somewhere in the middle where, where like, you know, I look back on it now and there was a period of whatever, seven, eight years, whatever, when I was in London and, and uh, to some extent I progressed, but in another extent I really stagnated. Um, I, I, you know, maybe I wish I could have come to Berlin sooner. I, I tried for years to find work here, and you know, I could have cut out a whole section of life and maybe short circuited the whole thing and got here sooner, maybe. But on the other hand, you know, I am where I am, and it's fine. And you, there's no point looking back. You just look forward. Thanks, thanks very much, Neil. That's very sanguine. And uh, I can see that we have some questions, and I, I, I think Vincent, you put your hand up first, and then we have. Eilish afterwards, and we have some questions in the chat as well. So, Vincent, if you could come in, please. Okay. Uh, firstly, Neil, congratulations. Um, I know your story because I do exactly the same thing in Milan. <laughs> and everything you said resonated, I can tell you. If you think it's dodgy getting transportation and logistics correct in Berlin, it's way <laughs> worse over here. <laughs> I started about 10 or 11 years ago and it was again it was for exactly the same reason there was a want I, I'm here I'm in Italy since 2010 and by kind of the end of 2011 I really wanted a cheeseburger and I couldn't get one <laughs> you know it's I love food I cook it's my thing and but there are certain things that you miss like as you said a nice bit of bacon I wanted a bacon cheeseburger friend of mine, a chef from America, Jeff the Chef, he said, Vin, I'm opening a restaurant. That's his name. Uh, it could be just clever American marketing and we don't know, but um, <laughs> he, he, he said, uh, I'm opening a restaurant. Will you come to my opening night? I did. There was no cheddar on, there was cheddar on the menu, but it wasn't in the burger. And I said it to Jeff. I said, Jeff, that said cheddar, but it's more like Gouda or something. He said, we can't get cheddar. Nobody can. This whole burger thing's going to explode now. And nobody can get cheddar. And I just thought, I get you cheddar. I'm Irish. And that's where it started. And that was 10 years ago. And now we have an online. We, we, we didn't open a shop. We went food service immediately. So we basically went directly into selling to you guys so we didn't have to open we didn't i don't know what that experience really would be like to open a uh like a bricks and mortar as it's called presence and um, we went 
we went food service, but I went door to door to every restaurant and burger shop in Milan with cheddar cheese in my hand. And then we thought if we could do cheddar cheese, let's go with the bacon. It's a bacon cheeseburger. Why don't we sell both? Then we moved into sausages. So now we're doing the Irish breakfast for all the Irish pubs. And we have an online thing only in the last while because transportation is a total mess here in Italy. You never know what you're going to get. Now, honestly, it's like a box of chocolates. <laughs> it's seriously, it's it, you could describe it as that. And it's only recent today is a, a day of applause because we finally found a transport company who does exactly what it says and delivers exactly what we ordered. Um, we were we've been doing it in Milan for ten years. Never a problem. Local transport company. They knew everything. They were able to do the picking. Um, but outside of Milan, it was a disaster. You couldn't get a company to go and do exactly what you wanted to do for the right price. Otherwise, there's no margins, or the the Irish pubs or restaurants would have to charge a fortune uh, just to put it on a menu. Very difficult to get that kind of balance right. In the end, we stopped. And then since this pandemic started, a lot of new transport opportunities kicked up because people were not moving places, but they had to transport things at the same time. So we started seeing advertising from kind of independent transporters on places like Facebook saying that we can do this. So I contacted people uh, in Italy and I said, nobody's going home this year for Christmas or nobody's been home. Would you like... Um, Irish sausages we sell them to pubs and everyone said yes and again <laughs> yeah everybody said yeah and that worked and it didn't work again logistics you never know what you're going to get what's going to come but we finally cracked it we finally cracked it I, I, you and I should have a, a, a exchange emails or numbers at least because we're doing exactly the same thing it was yeah. Michael Keating who uh, invited me here today to listen to you speak. He said, Vin, you and he do the same thing. Yeah. Why don't you uh, have this conversation? And yeah. again, just like you, just kind of landed into it out of a kind of a, what do we do? Uh, yeah. Kind yeah. Of, yeah. <laughs> and how does it work? Well, I think I think we can definitely learn from each other. And, and it sounds like you were taking that similar approach of like, okay, let's try this, see how it goes build on it or reject it and move on to the next thing. And, and, you know, we've always been balancing. So like we've ended up having a permanent store and an online store, but we were always were ready to pivot if we needed to. So it was like, like I say, first of all, we thought, well, maybe we can try a market stall and then everything shut down. We couldn't go outdoors, no market stall, forget about that. All right. So we've got a shop and, and this seems this retail thing seems to be going okay, but we think we're going to need an online store to pay the bills. So we'll work towards that. Meanwhile, I'm also like you hustling with like local bars and stuff to try and see if we can get a bit of wholesale going. We've got a bit of that going, you know, just making sure that we're uh, not putting all our eggs in one basket. And, and trying different things and everybody's but it, but again you know if it doesn't work it doesn't work and you, like our whole thing is like what's the minimum that we can do to move forward and then if it doesn't work you just drop it um so yeah, yeah. i mean we're very much on the same page and also what you said about people being quite um receptive to that this is not a perfect concept yet yeah i found i do exactly the same thing we have yeah. an online community here in, in italy yeah. and everybody knows that it might come, it might not come, and nobody has blamed me. People are still pushing me to continue doing it, even though they 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 might not get it. But they're like, the more you try it, the more chance you have of getting it right. And yeah. they and they want it anyway. So they're pushing the whole keep trying, keep going, keep doing it, push for yeah. Rome, push for Napoli, push for all these places. And I think it's great because. I didn't even know there were that many Irish in Italy until I started this. I, I didn't, I, I had my, my circle of friends and that was it. And now I'm realizing there's literally thousands of us here. And yeah, they get everywhere. They get everywhere. And, and, and I think, yeah, the, you know, the, what you're saying about the being honest about it and stuff like, um, I think it also helps that Irish people are generally speaking really nice. <laughs> like, <laughs> like we're, you know what I mean, we're target, but like we're not only targeting Irish people. Like our whole kind of premise with this whole thing has been: there's a bunch of nice foods from Ireland that we think that people here will like if only they find out about it. And it's great. Like the Irish, the Irish community has really responded to what we're doing, and it's given us a foundation to move forward. Um, and if we can sell to, you know, if we can sell to 100 of the 4,000 Irish people in Berlin, that's brilliant. But at the same time, like 
that's like 0.1% of the population of Berlin. So uh, if we can sell the 1% of the rest of the population, we're going to do a lot better. Um, yep. But yeah, I mean, like I say, it has helped us so much to start off with the Irish people who are just nice and understanding and tolerant and patient with what we're trying to do. And they've been super supportive of us. And, and you know, again, like some that I've heard people say before about like if, if you ask an Irish person for directions, the chances are they'll take you there. Um, yep. rather than just telling you where to go and that's been the thing with all of this as well it's not just like oh you're struggling oh too bad it's you're struggling let me help you and and yep. that, that has helped an awful lot i found exactly the same with the irish community here in italy that they they push you not just to, to make they know you're going to make mistakes i've made a good number of them by trusting transport companies to get it wrong mm -hmm. you, you, you know stuff like this and then we've done it again we've made the same mistake with a different company same mistake in a different way and uh this morning at eight o'clock this morning i got a phone call from the new transport company saying we're going to be at your door in 10 minutes are you awake and i'm like i've been awake since five o'clock for this <laughs> everything yeah. arrived i'm getting messages from all of our clients now saying things have arrived it's all working we got what we ordered uh, yeah. the company driver is very nice lots of these things and to me it was just great because it's like you're on a knife edge really thinking are they going to make a mistake again my reputation's going yeah. to drain <laughs> yeah. well, one of the things that's really impressed me about the logistics industry is the, the sheer number of new and innovative ways they can find to screw things up yeah it, it's it's really impressive <laughs> it, it's different every time you know yeah i gotta give it to them well maybe, maybe we'll have to do hand to hand uh hand to hand delivery from one irish community member to another to, to get it to the end destination like in the old days. And it's just some people here, conscious as others, who just want to ask a few questions yep. there. Yeah, we have uh, have quite the chat here, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, Paul McAllister said, is that Stokes brown sauce on the shelf? Please say yes. Then it, uh, I, my, my answer to that would be sometimes. <laughs> I can't, then, like to tell uh, the truth, one of the things that we've struggled to get lately even is just good old HP sauce. We've, we've had oh, a hard time getting it for months. So Stokes like, yeah, sometimes, Sometimes. Then is it, is it there now? Because I'll be on my way. I see you open it too. That's <laughs> uh, nice to hear a good Belfast accent there. Um, no, uh, no, we oh, don't have any right now. The my only wife's going to kill sauce... me. <laughs> <laughs> the only fried sauce that we've got at the minute is Chef. Which oh, it has um... to be Stokes from my wife or she'll go nuts. Yeah, it's the equivalent to your wife's shop, you know, Stokes brown sauce. Anyway, makes the sauce just taste better. Sorry anyway. about that. Do, do have the ketchup. Well, at the moment, well, but not Dr. the brand M Miriam, Miriam here has also said, do you still take product suggestions? Where is All the day, every tech? day. Yeah, great. And Absolutely. she says, where's the best tech you guys online? We're in Munich, but we'll definitely pop in when we're in Berlin next. But you are doing deliveries, right? Yes, uh, we do deliveries to all of Germany. Um, so you're welcome to pop on our website uh, and order. Um, uh, but like just generally speaking, we're pretty responsive on social media and stuff as well. So, you know, you can you can drop an email, you can use uh, Instagram or Facebook to get in touch with us. And uh, yeah, I know it'll be either myself or, or my wife that will respond, but we do our best to be as responsive as possible. It's, you know, like I said, like we we're, we're just two people doing our best and we like I know it sounds all cheesy and all, but we do actually really care about every message and every interaction that we we'll have. So like, if you take the time to ask us a question, we'll take the time to answer it. Um, so yeah, get in touch any way you want. And then we have a note here from Michael. I saw his camera coming on. Michael Keaton said, Vince and Neil, delighted that you have met here and wishing you a great exchange of ideas. And I think, uh, I think uh, uh, Michael, that's uh, definitely the case. Uh, I'm fairly sure that uh, Vince and uh, Neil will definitely be exchanging. Now, I have a hand up here from Eilish. Carol, Eilish, uh, if you want to come in and introduce yourself and uh, ask your question there, please. Hi, Neil. Um, can you hear me? First of all, Thomas, can you yep. hear me? Yeah. Yep. Um, okay, and apologies. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the screen here, but my camera is over here, so I'm going to try and, and talk in here. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for a really, really fascinating uh, talk and, and also Vincent for coming in there at the end as well. It was really, really interesting. Um, I am the agricultural attache here in the embassy, so um, I'm responsible for food and drink, uh, basically. Um, so I, I found your, your talk really, really interesting. Um, I have a number of questions, but it might also be a good idea maybe for uh, Thomas to put us in contact um, afterwards. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I know we're probably running out of time here and I've, I've quite a lot of questions uh, so okay. maybe a phone call afterwards would be really good yeah thanks no worries. 
Um, but but might might just mention one or two of them um, now. Um, uh, maybe ones that, that other people would be interested in as well. My first question was, uh, what are your most popular products, uh, either that you're currently <laughs> selling or that people are, are are requesting from you? Yeah, the 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 initial premise that we had of like uh, starting with like you know decent bacon and sausages has been what has propelled us this far. It's like we always figured, well, that will be that's something that you don't get anywhere else, and that will be the hook that brings people in, and then probably they'll pick up lots of other things as well. And that has proven to be true, and especially with online, like this, the idea that you can order this stuff and it and it gets delivered to you in a day or two, frozen. Nobody else is doing that. Um, and don't any of you start, okay? Um, no, <laughs> nobody else is doing that, and people are responding to it really well. So, like, that's the great bulk of it, and then they buy other things around it. Uh, so, yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, that's good to know. Uh, <laughs> and I can definitely see why that would be <laughs> why that would be the case. Yeah. Um, um, I was wondering as well, um, how are most people finding out about the shop at the minute? Is it word of mouth or social media or, or how's it going at the minute? So we, we, uh, do our best to kind of track that stuff. Um, so it's obviously a mixture of things. One of the things that really blew us up at the start was just simply posting in the Irish and Berlin Facebook group. Mm. Uh, yeah. that yeah. is what got the ball rolling for us. Um, you know, we, we obviously knew we had to promote ourselves, but and that's where we started. And it turned out that that was great because there was tons of people on there that were like wanting to get home to Ireland for Christmas and couldn't. Uh, so they came to us and, and you know, we sorted them out. Uh, that was that was where it started. Obviously, since then, we've we've you know been branching out into different channels. We get obviously a lot of people just searching for us online and stumbling upon our website. Um, word of mouth is starting to build up. Uh, well, I mean, it's been building up in Berlin, obviously, since the very beginning. Um, uh, word of mouth is definitely a major part of it, uh, but it's starting to build up online as well because we can see, we'll see things like somebody will order and then somebody else in the same tiny village in the middle of Bavaria will order from us as well. And you know that they've told them about it. Um, so, you know, things like that. Uh, yeah, you know, just Google shopping referrals and that kind of thing. We're dabbling a bit in promotion at the moment, just doing a tiny bit of advertising. But one of the things is as well, like we sort of like, especially with the online stuff, we sort of don't want it to grow too fast because we're not ready mm. for it. Um, so we're a bit careful about that. Uh, like we want, obviously we want to grow, but we don't want to grow too fast because we're, we just wouldn't be able to cope. Um, you know, we're, we're starting to scale up, but one step at a time. Yeah, I think something that that really hit me there when you when you're talking. Obviously, you're you're a business and you want the business to be as commercially successful as possible. But just what you're saying there about yourself and your wife really enjoying the actual engagement with people and actually being able yeah. to respond to when people send you an email or or a, yeah. you know a message in the Irish in Berlin or whatever. And yeah, that's that's something you might lose. Obviously, absolutely growing is fantastic, but the the enjoyment as well for yourselves. Yeah, that, 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 keeping that personal touch. There's a phrase that gets kicked around a lot in the in the startup community, and you know I have my I have my uh, issues with uh, some of the philosophy of a lot of that stuff. Like I was talking about, you know, the, the, this whole like move fast and break things philosophy, which you see a lot. Just really, I'm totally totally against it, and like it's, it's part of the reason why I don't work in that world anymore. But there's a guy called Paul Graham. He's like a big investor, and again, I've mixed feelings about some of the things he says. One of the things that he said, which I think is very pertinent for us, is do things that don't scale. So we try to be very personal at the moment. So with our messaging and everything else, like at the minute, you know, yesterday the DPD band didn't come to pick up the parcels that were supposed to go out. So I sat and I wrote a message individually to each person that that was supposed to go to to apologize to them that it's going to be late. Like I do small things like that. They don't scale. If we have 100 customers a day, I can't do that. I won't have time. But at the moment, it helps us to build our 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 identity our brand as well as our business and so i'll take yeah. the time to do those things like i try to make it as personal as i can at some point i won't be able to do it anymore but until then it's very beneficial because people come away with a really positive feeling about what you're trying to do yeah yeah absolutely um okay thanks that's, that's really interesting I, maybe one more question um or maybe two more questions, <laughs> if we have time. Um, you, one, this one was a question, and then you kind of answered it when you were talking to Vincent as well. But um, are, are, you, are most of your customers still now would be Irish people in in Germany, or, or is, are you it's, starting to see now more of a mixed 
it's a lovely mixture it's always been a mixture but it's a really lovely mixture actually um like one of the things that, that we're, we're catching on for which surprised me although it's great is like a lot of german people are coming to us and buying tea um because uh you know the, the, obviously germany's not known for being a big tea drinking country but there are tea fanatics just like there are anywhere else and people are finding out that we've got you know like like irish tea you know your bars near the lines and whatever is pretty good stuff and tons of people are dropping by just to buy some tea um and they'll pick up some other bits and pieces but it's like well if you're getting tea you might as well get some bickies you know and 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 it goes from there and, and but then we also just have like loads of people from all over the world that just come in i've got this one man he's italian and he comes in like weekly and buys like about four packs of jacob's cream crackers he's totally addicted to the things buys them by the boatload um it's the most improbable thing but there you go so you just never know like like we, you know we've got people coming in from kazakhstan or, or i mean you name it really people come in from everywhere and that's the fun of it you never know who's going to walk through the door and then you know i suppose it's actually coming back to the whole belfast thing this is something that um I've talked about before, but like when you grew up in Belfast, you have to be really like, at least in those days, you had to be really quick at sizing people up to try to understand, am I safe with this person? Like, can I have a safe conversation with this person? Are they, can I trust them? How far can I trust them? And you play this whole game of like revealing yourself in stages while trying to figure out the other person faster than they figure you out. And so in a weird kind of way, that's been really beneficial in doing something like this, because as soon as somebody walks in the door, you're trying to figure out what they're all about and trying to connect with them, trying to find an affinity. And yeah, I, I mean, I find myself doing that all the time. So like every person that comes in, obviously, is different, has a different story, different background. It's easy when they're Irish people. But yeah, I mean, how do you how do you sell um, beef pies to a guy from Kazakhstan? <laughs> Got to find an angle. But that's that's kind of the fun of it, you know? Yeah, that sounds that sounds really cool. Um, well, thanks, thanks so much. Um, I'll, I'll pass you back to, to Thomas from my side. But uh, no, really, really enjoyed that. It was really, really interesting, and really informative, and um, yeah, best to look with everything. So thanks. thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Neil. I'm conscious that we're coming close to what would be our normally allotted time, but I see uh, Elias's camera has come on. Elias, you want to raise a question there, please? Yes, so thank you very much, Neil, for this uh, entertaining and candid look into your life. Uh, really enjoyed your presentation. And uh, I have a very uh, short and straightforward question. So in one of the, the images in your presentation, I saw that you're selling Marmite. Yes. To me, this means that I now yes. absolutely have to check out your store and uh, maybe I'll drop by tomorrow. But I'm also wondering, are you selling any Irish candy or chocolates? Yeah, we have we have a number of different um, we, we have like your regular sort of Cadbury stuff. We're sold out of cream eggs at the moment. Sorry, trying to get some more. Hold on. Um, we have like regular Cadbury stuff, but we also have some things from some smaller people. There's like uh, this company called Broderick's and make some of these really delicious like tray bake type things like uh, sort of millionaire shortbread and Rocky Road type things. Those are really good as well. Um, yeah, come on by. We'll say some nice, nice sweets. Looking forward to it. Thank you. <laughs> you better get there quick, Elias, because I might be dropping down this evening uh, <laughs> and taking whatever stock is there. And uh, also just to say, Neil, uh, as, as by way of uh, thanking you for taking the time out of your of your day and to meeting us and to speak about your own experience, which uh, I think I speak on behalf of everybody here has been very fascinating and very, very open and uh, very revealing and very uh, touching too, actually. Just, uh, you know, I wrote down, open the shop because of love, you know, uh, help his wife <laughs> and, you know, that's, uh, love makes us do these things. It's, uh, well, love for uh, Jess, is it? Jess yep. and, uh, and uh, love of Irish bacon and l love of uh, giving uh, Irish bacon and Irish goodies uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the people of Germany. Um, I will drop down and uh, say hello, but we'll also bring a gift. It's a little small uh, gift of a book. It's about, it's called Pub Life. It's about Irish uh, pub owners, uh, pub operators across Germany, uh, who and uh, they, 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 they were all photographed maybe three years ago. It's not an exhaustive list of all of the uh, pub owners, uh, uh, Irish pub owners or operators or bar people or whoever, or, or, or staff. 
but um, who knows? Uh, maybe some of them could become your customers and you would be yeah. able to have a reference for them as well. It's a, a real it is indeed. So I will, I will drop and just to say thank you very, very much again uh, for, for, for taking the time to talk with us today. And to remind everybody that uh, this um, has been recorded. It will be published on the web embassy's website. So we'll material for uh, those who uh, wish to hear Neil's story and uh, making it in Germany, making it in Berlin. Thank you, Neil. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, if anyone has any further questions, I can hang a little bit longer. Uh, maybe another 10, 15 minutes if anybody wants to ask any more questions. You've got my okay. uh, email there. Definitely, yes. send, de definitely send me one. Yeah. Um, because it's the same story. Just slightly different clientele, but same story. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly the same. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have to run now, but if you email me, I'll give you a ton of information. A lot of mistakes I made that you probably should. If you're going into that food service business with these pubs, there's a way to... At least Italy might be different to, to Germany. I don't know. And Italy, I, I've realized that you'll definitely make more conversions on your sales if you meet them in person. Okay. And, and then you follow up with the, what I used to do was I used to, um, for, for example, with the cheese, what, what I used to do is I, I, I learned never talk to a restaurant manager. The restaurant manager <laughs> doesn't care about your product. He only cares about the price. Go directly yeah. to the chef. The chef will sell right. it for you. Right. Right. <laughs> the mm -hmm. chef doesn't care about the cost of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if it's yeah. good, yeah. the chef wants it on the menu. <laughs> That's good advice. <laughs> Stay away from the managers. <laughs> You'll make so many more conversions that way. Go directly yeah. to the chef because you're talking to somebody who talks about food, not about money. Good tip. <laughs> but I've yeah, loads we'll, more. We'll... I've loads more, but I have to go. Thanks very much. Um, a brilliant story, not just about the food part, but the whole the whole part that got you there. And right. um, I have to run, but thank you very much again. Everyone oh. else as well. Thomas Eilish, uh, yes. Botschaft von Ireland. <laughs> thank you as well. <laughs> and Michael, of course, who I can't see, but I know he's there somewhere. Take care and thanks very much. I have to run. Ciao. All right. Bye. Bye. Alla prossima volta, ragazzi. <laughs> And uh, Neil, there's a question there from uh, Miriam, which is best way to support you guys other than becoming a customer? Oh, um, well, definitely, uh, you know, if you can spread the word about us, that's that's always appreciated. Um, just tell your friends, uh, share our stupid social media posts, whatever, you know, whatever way that works for you. But the more people know about us, the more customers will have and the more opportunities that we'll have as well both yeah like i say in terms of doing business but also just like making connections and moving forward so yeah i mean it's not like i say it's not just about like meeting customers but like if if any further doors can open up then that's that's got to be good for us you know um neil i have one other question i i, I didn't ask it earlier but uh, brexit and meat products and all your stuff is coming from Ireland but yeah, in that category but then there are some other things that are not coming from Ireland so yeah have, have, has you, you started the shop after Brexit really commenced right I mean uh, com it was, well, like right <laughs> as it commenced it was like it was right it was like I say it was November and then officially everything sort of closed down in, in the, the January right after that so like we were able to get one delivery in from from the UK immediately before everything shut down yeah and since then the, has it been a a difficulty or is it just well i see i see the might... diplomat trying to find some diplomatic language here um yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh yes in short it has um like we we get most stuff even stuff that comes from the uk you know we have some products that are obviously british in origin but even then we mostly get them from ireland because that way the paperwork has been taken care of so so yeah. like right at the start like we we did we we did our first like big order from the uk and we thought okay that went fine let's try it again 
and it was a complete nightmare. Um, we actually had to give up. We spent something like 500 euros on, on red tape, uh, just trying to get it past the customs. If it's this for one pallet of stuff, you understand, so like your margins are gone. But in the, in the spirit of like learning, you know, we thought, well, let's try to do it and then we can, we can learn from that. Um, yeah, we spent about 500 euros on, on, on uh, admin from uh, customs agents and that kind of thing. And in the end, even then, we couldn't get it through and we had to give up and send it back. So that was very expensive and painful lesson for us as a, as a tiny fledgling business. We just gave up. Um, so, but again, stroke of fortune because uh, like, I just like phoned up Musgraves to say, hey, uh, is there anything you could do for us? And they were starting to think about this because they realized that there was going to be lots of people like us that wanted to get stuff. Uh, and I spoke to the guy and he's like, right, we don't really know how we're going to do this, but let's figure it out. And I said, I'm, I'm all about that. Let's go. Um, and so he said, I'll, I'll let me look into it. And we figured out a way to do it. And he says, like, if we put this pallet of stuff together for you, can you arrange for, for delivery? Uh, for collection and I'm like yeah I can because we are already getting stuff from Clonic Healthy Foods and the guy, the guy that transports that I just phoned him up and said hey do you want to join in on this daft thing that we're trying to do here so there's a but it's not just me that's like trying to wing it and figure it yeah. out uh, it was me and a guy in Musgraves and a guy from a from a haulier and we were all just trying to figure out how we might do this and find a way forward and now it's working really quite smoothly quite regularly like we had some bumps but now it works relatively smoothly and um, I suppose everybody's gained from it you know Musgraves has figured out a perspective on supplying stuff to the whole of Europe. Uh, and these, you know, the courier guys uh, have got more business coming their way, probably not just from us, but from others as well. And, you know, everybody benefits from it. And it was just from, it was what I said earlier on, like sometimes I, I'm at my best when I'm up against it and I start trying to figure out ways around things. And, that, and this was the way around it that we figured out. And, and, you know, we're moving forward okay now. But it was quite the hitch. It really was. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks. I, can't, I can't remember now the the name of the the city, but a town. I think it was in NRV. Um, there it was an article. I think it was in Handelsblatt. Um, and uh, they were British shops, shops specifically yeah. originally for the last twenty years selling British food. Um, and yeah, they the, the mentioned in this article that uh that they could, it was too difficult anymore, and yeah. they had shifted to either selling some Irish product or buying. British produce through Ireland, yeah. similar to what you just mentioned there. Yeah, so it's so certainly for the smaller shops, big, you're not the only one. This was a big driver, like with our whole sort of brand identity, this was a big driver behind it because there's a couple of things going on here. There's one shop in Berlin that, that has been here for a long time It's that specialized in British foods and it's called Broken English, right? And the thing is like that shop's been around for like 20 odd years, probably 25 years, something like that. And you know, at the time when they called that Broken English, it was probably relatively cool to be English. Like it was all Spice Girls and, you know, Cool Britannia type stuff at the time. And it was probably, that probably seemed like a reasonably cool thing to be. It's not anymore. And through no fault of the shop, you know, like the, the, just everything shifted and they found themselves like, you know, married to a concept, which unfortunately the world has kind of moved on and left behind. We wanted to be really careful not to attach ourselves to anything too close to like national identity or whatever. Um, and for me, you know, because obviously growing up in, in Belfast and, and also having this affinity with Scotland, I wanted to bring in Scottish products as well, things like haggis and stuff like that. So I thought about, well, what way can we do that in a way that ties it all together? And we thought about the, the ancient kingdom of Dalreda, which was, you know, part of the north east of Ireland and the west of Scotland. Uh, and, and, you know, we just kind of formed a concept around that. And, um, also, it was a word that we figured that people from different countries would be able to pronounce, more or less. Uh, whereas most most Irish terms, you can forget about it um, for an international audience. Uh, so, like, like there was a real a real conscious thing about our whole branding was that we wanted to be explicitly like not flags and not like sort of cheesy Irishness or anything like that. We wanted to be like non non political and make it really about about the food. Uh, and and yes, of course, about the service and everything else, but like we we didn't want to be a British shop, you know, or an Irish shop just selling things to uh, you know the the immigrant community. Um, we wanted to be more outward reaching than that, and to take like I say, our whole idea was always like we think people will like these things if we can bring them, bring it to them, but. You know, we have we, we have to start somewhere, and that was with our lovely Irish community here. Um, who have responded really well to what we were doing. 
but we're not stopping there. You know what I mean? We're not just servicing people like that. We believe that this food is is something that other people will enjoy if only they would try it. I've probably answered about five different questions in one go there, but I, I you, 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 you did, and thanks for that. And also, Miriam has asked another question here again. Um, what do you like about living in Berlin compared to <clears throat> London, especially? Good question. Um, the the thing, like I said, uh, you know, if I could summarize it in a sentence, it's that London takes more than it gives. Um, London's a great place to live if you're a millionaire. Uh, it's nonstop fun and games if you've got tons of money. If you haven't, it's just a relentless grind that, that kind of sucks the life out of you. I wanted to live in a city that had a lot of the things that I liked about London, you know, culturally. Uh, there's, you know, culture wise, there's a lot going on here, um, just like there is in London. Um, I wanted to be able to avail of all of those kinds of things without spending an arm and a leg to live in a hovel. Uh, and, and, you know, this is a great city to live if you don't have a lot of money. There's plenty going on that doesn't cost anything. There's plenty of green spaces. You know, the, the weather is marginally better. Um, you can get outdoors a bit more, uh, you know, I, I, and, and I just find that the, there's, there's a lot less pretentiousness about it somehow. There's still, like everybody in London's kind of putting on a face one way or another. Everybody's pretending to be something more important or more successful or whatever than they really are. There's a lot of people putting on a front and Berlin doesn't care for fronts at all. And I appreciate that myself, you know, I, like I say, you know, don't be anything that you're not. Uh, I find that here, Berlin is very accepting of people just being who they are, and I like that. I, 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 as you say that, it reminds me of how there was a an it it person some time ago here in Germany did not really take off at all. You know the way there's these people who are it people in a uh, yeah and um, famous for being what, famous. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, that tallies with what you say in, in a lot of respects. So maybe maybe at that we will um, finish out for the for the day. Uh, if unless anybody else has a question, uh, and again I just want to say thanks, Mr. Neil. It's uh, it's been a it's been a real pleasure actually having you here. <laughs> and I'll I'll drop down with the book and uh, bring my shopping bags with me as well. I want to get some of that uh, whatever you have in there uh, available. <laughs> To me, that uh, that's always going to be something that I want. Yeah. So thanks. For All, right. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll look forward to it and I'll see you soon. See you soon, Neil. Thanks, thanks for listening, everybody. Bye bye. Thanks, Neil. Bye.